Hi, and welcome to Why Do We Do That, a psychology podcast that deconstructs human behavior from the perspectives of social scientists, psychologists, and others that use applied psychology in their work. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Moyer. In this episode, I sat down with Dr. Stuart Vise. Stuart is a behavioral scientist who specializes in superstition and irrational behavior. He is a contributing editor for Skeptical Inquirer magazine and has written articles for The Observer, Medium, The Atlantic, and Time. He's authored several books, including Believing in Magic, The Psychology of Superstition, which won the William James Book Award of the American Psychological Association. His latest book and topic of our conversation was published in May of 2022 and is called The Uses of Delusion, Why It's Not Always Rational to Be Rational. Stewart's Psychology of Superstition book was a guiding light for me as I was working on my dissertation around 2008 to 2010. So it was very exciting to meet him and talk about his new book on irrational thinking. The main takeaway for me is that while it is assuredly a good idea to identify and avoid all of the ways in which our brains will feed us irrational information and sometimes corrupt our decision making, there are some cases where you can find value moving away from rationality. Many of these situations relate to how we evaluate ourselves. A healthy dose of overconfidence in our ability can potentially protect us from negative moods and keep us moving forward towards our goals. Just think of all the effort society puts into helping people with low self-esteem have more positive views of themselves. We also explore how being too rational can be harmful when it comes to health, relationships, and performance. The bottom line is that while rational thinking is clearly the best strategy for solving problems, it may not be the best strategy for maximizing our well-being. I tend to think of myself as someone that is perhaps overly rational. If you're a die-hard rational thinker like myself, pay very close attention to the scenarios we discuss in our conversation. Enjoy. All right, I am here today with Stuart Vise. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I'm really glad to be here, Ryan. Thanks for inviting me. Wonderful. So we're going to be talking about your new book, uh, which is called uh, The Uses of Delusion, Why It's Not Always Rational to Be Rational. And uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed reading the book. Uh, ba basically, uh, establishes this idea that uh, behaving rationally is an uphill battle, uh, but there, there's hidden value in irrationality in very specific contexts. Uh, so what inspired you to tackle this topic? Yeah, it, it, it's a little off base for me. You know, I spent my whole life writing about rationality and, and you know, uh, I wrote a book about superstition with the hope that people would read it, understand the psychology of superstition, and then not be superstitious. Uh, and I write, you know, for a skeptical magazine, uh, you know, my whole career has been aimed at getting people to be more rational. Uh, but I kept bumping up against examples uh, in my own work of places where things that people did. And again, as you, you correctly mentioned, they're in fairly specific instances, but things that people did that were not entirely rational, in some cases, they knew they weren't rational, and yet they benefited them. And, you know, so I, in, in the true manner of science, I want to be objective about it and recognize that this is a fact. Uh, and, uh, and so once I sort of established that there were enough of these examples, I felt as though this was a good way to sort of balance the scales and to, and to fill out the picture of humanity a little bit by pointing to instances that are beyond reason or not, not rational that nonetheless benefit people. So how would you describe in general, the limits of human rationality, uh, because we know that we know humans have a very high capacity for thinking rationally. We can engage in 
we, we've created fields of mathematics and sciences and we can solve problems and you know pretty well uh, but uh, there are obvious limits to human rationality uh, is there a general rule that sort of describes uh, the this this edge I wouldn't say that there's a general rule because some of the examples are quite different from others in the book, for example. But uh, but there is a sense in which, you know, we are these brilliant creatures. You know, we 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 can calculate and we have done these wonderful things with our brains, usually often working collectively, not as individuals. But but nonetheless, we have this great power. Um, but we are also, you know, only had that cognitive ability for the last 70,000 years and uh, or so. And so we came a long way before we were this smart. And, and I believe that there are some aspects of, of that earlier evolution that still remain in us and that we, and that we cling to uh, uh, from time to time. So, so uh, you know, it's, I don't know that there's a general rule, I would say, but, that, but there clearly are these examples that, that seem to be quite obvious when you look at them where doing something against what your rational brain would tell you to do uh, still ends up being a good thing. I really like the line uh, in the book that des describing the, the goal of cognition, saying that the goal is survival, not intelligence. That's right. And that's, that's right. that was all that's kind of always been my uh, my thoughts around rationality that uh, that to the extent that some sort of mechanism solves a particular problem, it will it will continue to reproduce and we'll and we'll see it grow. But if it doesn't, there are going to be these like blind spots. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I remember the old science fiction movies where they they there were like these future characters and they had these enormous brains, you know, as, as though as though that was the path of evolution was that we need to get bigger and bigger brains. But that's clearly not not necessarily true. You know, it is right. uh, other species seem to be doing fairly well with little brains and uh, and our brains were not so big, uh, you know, in the past. So so there's a lot that and, and it is you know, I'm glad you brought up that that line, you know, the 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 goal is survival. You know, it is the thing that gets you to the next day that counts. And that may be in many cases, you know, rational thinking that gets you there. But in other circumstances, it's not. Now, if we take it to a specific example, um, one of the early examples you talk about is uh, you're you're at a restaurant and you maybe you feel rushed by the server, which causes you to order something that maybe you, you didn't immediately want or wasn't the best choice on the menu for you. Uh, and I like how that kind of illustrated that that in everyday life, there are other factors, in, you know, in human life, there's other factors that are always kind of operating in the background and that could kind of cut in line for uh, in terms of making that that optimal decision, what are some other examples that, that we see sort of in everyday life that might kind of make us uh, realize where the, where this would happen? Well, I think that I mean you're getting at one of the one of the what I think is one of the biggest areas where where we don't make always make rational decisions, and that's in in uh, cases of self control where where we frequently it's almost. A, you know, it's almost a kind of pandemic in a way in that in, for us personally, in the sense that we frequently make uh, choices for an immediate reward uh, and, and in so doing jeopardize a much larger future reward. So, so, you know, ordering the, the uh, strawberry cheesecake for dessert when you probably shouldn't, uh, but it's right there and it's very attractive. Uh, spending money that you know you don't really have. Oh, it's okay. I'll be able to handle it later. Uh, you know, there are just a, many, many in the health domain and and in finance and other areas of life. We are constantly challenged by by the the incredible power of an immediate reward uh, versus a, a delayed one. And uh, and so the, that's irrationality, but it's not in my view, uh, and that's a huge area, and I have written about that in the past, but but that's not a useful uh, you know, form of irrationality. It, it, for the most part, 
many people are uh, do make you know these bad decisions and and think that they can get get away with them and 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 they regret them in the in the future. But but you know we 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 have a battle between our current self and our fu- future self, and uh, and often often our current self wins. It, it always becomes salient to me at the at the grocery store when you're trying to you know when you're going up i tend to go up and down the aisles and spend a lot of time staring at stuff before i actually put it in my basket and on on one hand you could say uh why don't i just be uh calculated analytical and rational in this situation and and just start looking at nutrition facts if I'm trying to pick cereal or something like that. And, you know, that's the rational thing to do is to look at all the facts and information. But then the other side of me says, is, I don't think that is rational. I think it's way more rational to lean on my instincts and preferences. So in, do you think that the latter is the rash, quote unquote, rational choice in that for these low stakes types of decisions. I, I mean, I think that I think that's a, uh, you know, a difficult question to answer. I, I think it, it depends on the specific case. Uh, there's no question that that if your intuitions are based on good habits over the years, uh, you know, that's where they come from, right? That, that you've made a lot of choice, choices in the past. And, and so those become sort of your inclinations now in the present. Uh, if, if you've done that well in the past, then I think you can, you can rely on your intuition and not, not necessarily scrutinize everything. Um, uh, but, but it's, that's, that it depends, you know, it depends on where those intuitions have been, uh, generated and, and, and what they lead to now. So uh, that, that is the, there's no question that, that intuitive, you know, gut decisions are quicker and easier. And so the, and the, and there's real benefit in that. I'm not, I'm not putting that down in any way. We, we are, despite our brains, we are of limited capacity and we can't, we can't do everything. Uh, we, have to, we have to economize to some degree so that we have enough brain space left over for the important things that require it. Um, but uh, but you know, whether your intuitions are good to follow or not is a very controversial and specific kind of uh, decision to make. Mm-hmm. Now, the uh, you mentioned earlier uh, self-control and that irrationality is often the consequence of a failure of self-control to regulate a decision or something like that. Uh, in my dissertation, uh, I looked at, at superstition and some of the causes and, and connections to the, to the self. Um, and one of the inspirations for even looking into superstition and the, the, the cause, the causal factors of superstitious behavior was I, I read this line that, that said um, uh, in, in, a, in an article or a book or something like that, that if you look at superstitious charms like rabbit's feet and stuff like that, if you actually press people and you push them about the issue, eventually they'll sort of admit that, you know, I, I know it doesn't actually work. It, it just makes me feel better. And it kind of, it, it kind of opened this door to, oh, it's, it's not that a lot of irrationality is the result of lack of intelligence or lack of knowledge, that there's something else operating there. So to what extent in, gen- in terms of your analysis of, of irrational behavior, uh, how much of it is related specifically to self-control versus lack of intelligence well so i i think a lot of it is 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 related to this issue of you know what what you're pointing to is a sort of a double consciousness right that the the person is aware of the fact that they feel better doing it right that may be the most salient part of it for them but that but when pressed they also realize that you know scientifically it can't work but I just feel better if I do it. I mean, I think that's a wonderful sort of human dilemma that we're in often. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, is, it is, has been related uh, by some researchers to the sort of dual processing model uh, that we've been talking about a little bit without naming it. 
um, in which in which we either you know system one is this quick intuitive way of reasoning, system two is uh, is a more rational you know deliberate cognitive ability to calculate and reason, uh, and and so I mean obviously this is kind of a metaphor, but. But the view is that we have these two ability, we use these two different styles of thinking in different circumstances. And, 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 then it's, and some researchers talk, writing about superstition, in fact, have suggested that, 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 they can, that they can be, we can hold those ideas in our heads at the same time. And we can recognize that something that we're doing uh, for, for system one reasons doesn't make sense to system two, and yet we're going to do it anyway. Uh, and and uh, I think that's a that's a, a kind of an amazing thing, a, a clearly very human thing. I doubt that other species can can do that. Uh, and uh, right. and and it, it just an interesting window into our psychology. And it's also frustrating because when you when you understand the mind as having these two often competing mo motives of this intuitive, in, our intuition and our rationality, um, it almost, it makes it, in my view, extremely difficult to even define what rationality is. I mean, yeah. I don't, how do you even define a rational choice when we clearly have two competing motives? Right. Right. I mean, and there, there is a lot of uh, debate about how you, how, what is, what is rationality? How do we, how do we get there? And, you know, one view is that rational behavior is behavior that is logical it's based on evidence. Uh, and, you know, you, you have established rational beliefs because you've looked at the world and measured it and thought about it. And then you've logically come up with the implications of what you've learned and you act accordingly. So it's all sort of rigid and, and, and evidence-based. Uh, but there is also a sort of pragmatic view that, that regardless of what your beliefs are, uh, you know, if, if those beliefs lead to uh, a good outcome for you, then that's rational. In, uh, in other words, if you, if, you, if you achieve your goals, even on the basis of beliefs that don't fit you know what we would think of as being rational, that that should be considered rational. Uh, you know, Jonathan Barron, a psychologist at, at Penn University of Pennsylvania, you know, has said that you know in a quote that I use in the book, something to the effect of you know if following all the rules of logic, uh, you know, gets you eternal happiness, right? Then that's that's rational, but if violating every single one of the rules of logic gets you happiness, then that too is rational. That's, you know, whatever, whatever gets you to the, to the outcome in his view. And that's a, that's, that's a view that is, uh, that is um, consistent with sort of pragmatism. Uh, there was a school of philosophy, uh, uh, American pragmatism, Henry, uh, William James was associated with it and others as well. And, and that's sort of the viewpoint I'm using in the book. I, I want people to be rational most of the time, right? That, that I think that's the better path. And, and we have enough people trying to tell us uh, that, you know, crazy things that aren't rational today. But, but, uh, but at the same time, you know, you, I think it's, it's only honest to recognize that certain beliefs that don't make sense in terms of logic and evidence still lead to positive outcomes. And that's what I'm trying to acknowledge in the book. Yeah. And, and it also, the, the complexity of this kind of debate of the pragmatism versus like a strict rational view of, of, of or a strict uh, sort of analytical view of rationality. Uh, it also bumps up against this idea of, of happiness and well-being in the sense that, you, you know, you just said that uh, perhaps making irrational decisions is what quote unquote works for you. But if you define works for you as makes you happy, you could then 
dispute that and say, well, is happiness even the goal? So, you know, it, it's most salient when you talk about vices in your, in your book, when you talk about things like smoking or, or poor eating habits, a pragmatist view of rationality would say, well, eat the piece of cake. It makes you happy, right? Uh, if that's what makes you happy, then that is a rational decision for you. But we know that that's, that can often conflict with long-term goals. So um, specifically in, in the section of your book, when you're talking about health and vices, uh, what do you have to say about, about rationality in terms of balancing or juggling short-term rewards versus these long-term consequences? Right. Well, so uh, first of all, I'd just like to make a recommendation about if you want to read uh, a book that's readable and, and has interesting things to say about self-control, I recommend uh, Howard Racklin's book, The Science of Self-Control. And he, you know, he deals with all these issues and it's a book that very much influenced my thinking. Um, but in my book, in the chapter on health, I, I look at this as being a situation where um, either the, you know, the person is, uh, and, and it's hard not to think about the pandemic in these terms, as I do talk about it uh, in the book, but, but uh, the idea that if you're a healthy person, uh, you know, you're, you're at a good status quo, but, but there might be a looming threat, like something you should do now that will prepare you for something in the future, right? And, and that situation is one where it's important to do the right thing. Uh, and then there's also the case where you've lost the status quo of good health, you're injured, or you're in a rehab mode, and then there are things that you know, that you should probably do there. And I talk about irrational optimism and irrational pessimism in relation to those kinds of situations. So, so uh, optimism when you're healthy, but there's a looming threat, oh, it's no big deal. I don't have to worry about it, I'll be fine. That leads to a, that leads to a, a potentially a bad outcome uh, and may, may not be a good kind of irrationality. Uh, whereas, interestingly, a bit of, uh, of uh, defensive pessimism, you know, being, being worried about a, a future outcome, although it's not pleasant in the moment to be, this, to be pessimistic and worry that you're going to get sick or whatever, what it does do for you, and it's unrealistic because it, uh, people who show it often, often have had good success in the past, and yet they're predicting failure in the future, uh, but that form of irrationality actually leads to productive action in the present. You know, you, th these are the kinds of people who will wear masks, who will avoid, you know, unnecessary contact in, a, in the case of a virus or do other things to promote, promote future health. Um, uh, whereas, you know, once you're sick, being either overly pessimistic, that's certainly not going to be helpful. You're not going to, if you're pessimistic when you're, when you're already ill and you're trying to recoup the, the feeling of, of good health, uh, that's going to lead to inaction uh, and, and you know, acceptance of the, of the condition. Whereas optimism, even if it's irrational optimism, will lead to more productive behavior. People will cope better with it. I mean, this is well-known research uh, from, you know, Taylor and Brown that, 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 uh, that people cope with it better. They also are more active in their, in their recovery if they have some sense of hope about where they're headed. Now, do you think that um, if, you, if you factor in an individual's values, is it fair to define behaving rationally as behaving in line with your values? So let's take this to the pandemic. If you value independence, personal responsibility, you're responsible for your own health, things like that, and then you approach the pandemic as I'm going to live my life as as such. Uh, I'm not going to let it. I'm not going to let the pandemic affect me. I'm going to business as usual, right? Psychologically right. and in terms of action. So that aligns to that value, your values. And then you could take another person who values uh, uh, cooperation and care and doing what's best for your fellow man. And, and so we need to 
behave as a group and do what's best for everyone, not which not uh, just not just what's what is best for me. Are both of those individuals behaving rationally? I, I would say yes. I mean, I like the way you set that up. I, I think that the I think that um, the, the individual's values do matter, uh, and and it's and of course the many of the people who have resisted masks, for example. Um, have said that they they just feel though their personal freedom is their most important thing and that's why they want to do it. Unfortunately, you know, science would say that their personal freedom has costs for other people. So so there's a conflict there. Um, but uh, but yes, I think I mean even you know I, I talk in the book about um, Gary Becker, an economist, Nobel Prize winning economist, who who proposed a theory of of, of rational addiction. You know, he, he suggested that that people who start to smoke uh, may and, and you know, as, as even as I'm saying it, you can imagine how this did not go over very well. But he suggested that people who uh, start to smoke, you know, factor in the future and they say, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to take this pleasure that I'm getting now, uh, even though it may cost me both financially and in health in the future. And they're making a rational choice. Uh, you know, like most classical economists, I think he he put too much stock in our ability to see the future clearly, right? Uh, I don't think that we do. We are much more myopic in our assessment of things than than they gave credit to. But 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 there's something there. In other words, yeah. you know, the person who eats the eats the strawberry cheesecake after having had a full meal, uh, you know, is is happy in that moment. And there's a, and you could say. You could say my goal in life is to be happy in this moment, right? That's what I want to do, and and uh, you know who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And there are people who espouse this kind of philosophy. So so I think that you it is it is it does depend to a degree on on people's values, and uh, and and it, that changes the equation to some degree. Yeah, as a as a former cigarette smoker, I can attest. I would at least at the surface level would describe myself as a rational smoker in the sense that, um, you know, people ask me, you know, why do you do that? And it's like, well, I like it. And it's, it's not, there's, there's, I think uh, Dave Chappelle in one of his stand up specials, he would say the same thing. It's like, cause I like it and it makes me feel good. But on, on the surface, I would say super rational, but part of me is just waiting for a moment to to shatter that sort of rational view of smoking in the sense that, you know, if you take a hypothetical instance of somebody who calls himself a rational cigarette smoker, and then they find out that a, a friend's father had a heart attack because of smoking, uh, you know, they, they've 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 had heart problems and it's probably related to tobacco smoke. If you then take that and you're like, wow, that that changes everything. For me now, I, I won't do this anymore. It makes me wonder if there was a value to begin with. It makes me wonder if if a single instance changes my whole perspective on a behavior. Right. Was it really rational to begin with? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, the the uh, you know the again maybe maybe Becker is also giving too much credit to people at the very beginning. You know when they when they choose to to start. Uh, uh, not only not only is he seeing us as being more farsighted than we really are, but also being more conscious. You know, you know, you, the first cigarette. I don't know, you know, if you can remember the first cigarette, but it, but I'll bet it was in a social context of some kind with other people around, and it may not have been something that you thought about very, uh, very, you know, seriously. So, so uh, yeah, I, it, it values values make it sound like it's a much more high high level kind of decision than perhaps it is often. So in, in your book, uh, one of the uh, biggest topics of discussion in terms of the value of irrationality relates to self-beliefs, views of ourselves, uh, and how we assess our performance, how we assess actions, uh, could you talk a little bit about self-deception and how there might be some some hidden value there? Yeah, yeah, this is an interesting thing. The uh, 
and, and I think that one of the people who states it most clearly is this guy, Robert Trivers, who is an evolutionary biologist. And he has proposed the idea that, that humans uh, evolved the propensity for, for self-deception uh, specifically because it has a value in deceiving others. Uh, and so, so in competitive, in, I mean, he has a number of examples, but, but in competitive situations in particular, I, I talk a fair amount about tennis in the book. And, uh, and so, you know, if you are a tennis player, uh, it's good to, it, you know, it's, there's absolutely true that if you feel confident and, and, you know, go into the match in a confident way that you will perform better. Um, but, uh, but you, it's also important that you really believe it, right? And, and so if you, if you don't, aren't absolutely convinced of your ability and, your, and, and the fact that you can win this match, uh, then, and you instead sort of put on a face, uh, Trevor suggests uh, uh, that, that that's gonna be detectable by the competition. They're gonna be able to see that your, your emotions are, are pasted on, they're not real, and that will be seen as weakness and, and there will, advantage will be taken. So, so it sort of suggests that you should, if you're a tennis player, you should be like a robot. You, know, you should be this cyborg that just keeps coming and coming and coming. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I talk about the fact that many sports commentators uh, say that when, when a player has a tantrum, you know, on the, on the court, that this is the way they psych themselves up, right? Uh, which I think is a silly idea. Uh, maybe it is true for that individual player, but what they're ignoring is the fact that there's somebody on the other end of the court who's just as happy as heck that this guy has broken out into a, into a tantrum. It's a sign that, that he, I, it's, a, it's an effect of my good play that this person is doing this. And so, so, uh, so yes, yeah, self-deception as a means of, succeeding in in competitive situations and and others as well and and you also see this in you know you take uh, two individuals at equal skill level let's say you know basketball or let's say tennis for example if if one of them is is overconfident in their ability and that caught and that some it creates some sort of you know, eye of the tiger, or um, it, it gives them, it, you know, there's, there's, there seems to be sort of this jolt of confidence that, that can help performance, that someone who's doubtful of their abilities doesn't have. Now, obviously, the person that doesn't have the confidence, per, you know, perhaps they practice more, and, and, and that helps them. But is there some value to just simply believing that, you're better at an activity than you actually are. I, I think. I think in some of these situations, yes. I mean, there are some drawbacks as well, which we can talk about. But, but I, I think that in these situations, absolutely. That that uh, you know that you know what, where does confidence come from? Confidence comes from success in the past, right? That's part of the reason. But but once you test yourself, once you're at the limits of your ability, you don't know whether you can you can do this or not. And, and, but coming into the situation, believing you can, even if that represents sort of irrational overconfidence, it can't hurt. It can only help. And uh, uh, there, you have nothing to do but lose, right? That's the only cost. Uh, and so, uh, so that's, that, that's, a, I think, a very beneficial thing. And it, and it reminds me of some of the research on luck, which uh, if I'm not mistaken, some of that work showed that that if you believe that you are a lucky person, right? So we're just going to ignore the fact that luck is sort of a, a nebulous, irrational idea that mm -hmm. that some you know. But but if you act, it's not so much the construct of luck that's important. It's whether or not you believe you're lucky. And if you believe you're lucky you tend to approach challenges more. And I always thought that was an interesting uh, finding. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts uh, about that? Uh, no, I mean, other than that, that's a, that represents a source of, a, of, a, of some kind of confidence. E even, if you're, 
even if your assessment that you're lucky is wrong and that and it's and it's derived from sort of a biased uh, you know assessment of your past experiences where you you revel in your successes and sort of forget about your 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 failures uh, and then come as a result achieve this this view that you're lucky uh, again uh, that's a source of confidence that you know even if it's not a skill-based source of confidence it's something in the stars right which doesn't quite make sense but but it would be a source of confidence I would be worried since since luck tends to be based in random things you know that it might encourage some behavior that would you know I, I I'm concerned about people who believe in the concept of luck and then go to the casino right where where luck doesn't in fact matter at all um, and and lose their money as a result so uh, but but uh, but just on the basic level yes I mean if, if it's a, if it's a skill-based activity, uh, and you believe that you have some some luck in you, that's just going to be another source of confidence that probably will help. Mm -hmm. uh, another application of uh, of a rationality that might have value uh, relates to depression in the sense that there's this idea called depressive realism that uh, is seen in the literature that depressed people tend to have more accurate views of their ability, which is which is a, a a tough it's a tough pill to swallow that 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 there's some sort of advantage. Well, again, whether you want to call it an advantage or a benefit, uh, that's I guess that part is kind of up for debate. But uh, could you talk a little bit about about this idea that 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 re that having a more accurate view is often found where uh, where individuals have have a little bit of depression or or a yeah. lowered mood. Sure. Yeah. No. It's an interesting, uh, wonderful. Uh, well, I mean, it's 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 a very interesting finding, and uh, uh, and it does have some good implications. So so uh, uh, this is a, a very famous study in which. Uh, uh, two groups of people, one mildly depressed and one not, one typical functioning, were asked to press a button and determine whether the button turns on a light. And, and it was rigged up in a crazy experimental psychology sort of way where, where sometimes you press the button and nothing would happen. Other times you press the button, it would light. Uh, sometimes the button, you, the light would come on when you hadn't pressed the button. You know, and so they had to determine how much control they had over the button after after a while of, of this experience, and the the typical participants over overestimated their degree of control the, that they had on the, over the light, and the mildly depressed people were quite accurate in there, and so the the subtitle of the article is something like sadder but wiser, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, the thing is is that. It suggests a couple of things. One is that that this, that that overconfidence is uh, is a basic quality of of good mental health, right? At least that's one possible in, implication of this. That that a, what we consider to be typical uh, good functioning uh, in life involves uh, overconfidence about your abilities, uh, and that and if you lose that, then then you, you know you're you're you, you become more realistic, but, but also not as happy. Um, so, so, you know, overconfidence is a lot of what I do talk about in the book in a number of contexts. We've also already mentioned it in terms of, of um, health, but, but uh, you know, that seems to be a very human thing that we, we overestimate our abilities in a number of areas. And, and sometimes that's bad. You know, so there are certain circumstances in which that's a bad thing, but, uh, but uh, I think on a day-to-day -day level, it's probably a, generally a good thing. It made me think of, you know, this idea of overconfidence as, as sort of indicative of, of positive mental health. Uh, it, it immediately gets me thinking about our culture and how we are, um, we, we, we are labeling lots of behavior as narcissism nowadays, right? Like, like, oh, this, you know, that's very narcissistic to say that it's very narcissistic to do that. And it made me wonder if we're overusing narcissism to label behavior, given that 
that we all need a little bit of overconfidence in our lives. Do you, do you agree? Yeah, I do. And, and, uh, you know, so nar narcissism, of course, is a term that is, uh, you know, a psychiatric term. And, uh, and I, I think that actually when the term narcissism was invented, uh, if they could flash forward to today with social media and Instagram and everything, they would probably assume that we are all narcissists today. You know, we are all doing selfies all the time. And, uh, you know, Narcissus was somebody who looked in the water at his face. I think that's how it worked, but according to the myth, uh, but uh, we're doing that all the time now. And so uh, I, I do think that, um, that, uh, I'm not. I'm not somebody who's in favor of labeling everything a, a mental disease. I think there's just you know that's not productive. Uh, but uh, but I do think that a certain degree of self focus uh, is you know keeps you going right. If if you thought that your life was uh, you know not worth living and you know th then that would be a problem. And and so so how do you how do you feel good about yourself? You establish some overconfidence. You 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 dwell on your successes so that you feel good about that, and and uh, and you try to minimize your worry about losses and so on. So, yeah, I think I think we all need a little bit of narcissism in our lives. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, that, that's by far the first. I'm, I'm I'm certain that's the first time narcissism has been referred to in the positive sense, <laughs> um, uh, at least on this show. Uh, yeah. The so um, I said a little bit. A little bit. Right? <laughs> um, it, it does make me wonder, specifically talking about overconfidence and, and some of the benefits. Are we, should we be moving the bar or the, or rather the umbrella of rationality to include quote unquote overconfidence? Should we, would you go so far as to say it is, it is rational to not challenge your overconfident ideas like should should we just lean into it and say it's okay to be overconfident would you go that far yeah i would except that as you uh, i as you point out in the book that that i i do break out certain situations where it's useful and others where it's not and uh but but i i don't think it, i don't think there i mean there there are many of these examples in the book where the person is clearly behaving in an irrational fashion and yet the person looking at the situation says but it would be silly for me to tell them to sort of snap out of it and see the world more clearly because it's working for them and and so in many cases uh, of overconfidence, like the competitive ones we've been talking about, also perhaps in day-to-day -day work and business situations. Uh, you know, if, if you have a degree of confidence about your abilities and what you're going to achieve each day at work, even if they're unrealistic, that's, that's got to be a positive thing as long as you, you know, are, are still in that situation. Um, where I talk about the, dam the, the, the problems with overconfidence, are in the at the beginning of an enterprise at the as you're about to launch something uh, where there might be real serious downsides to what you're what you're doing if it if it doesn't have you know costs or worries associated with it that's a different thing but you know for example the obvious example is launching a business right you start a business now it turns out that something like 50% of all businesses fail within the first 5 years so so there's a downside to that uh, and in fact, we've actually established bankruptcy laws in order to make it easier for people to take the risk of starting a business. You know, that's that's what they're for. But uh, but there are potential downsides for you, for your employees, you know, and so forth. Uh, and that's not a time when you want to be overconfident. You want to be very cool and rational. Think about all the ways it could fail. Be sure that you've taken everything into account. Uh, and then start your business if that's if that's the outcome that that you come to, um, but but and so overconfidence can be bad. I mean, that, the most obvious example I mentioned in the book is starting a war. You know, many wars have been started right. with these the belief that this will take a month and we'll be done, right? And twenty years later, you're still fighting the war. Uh, so 
so um, that's where overconfidence is bad. But but most of us are not like launching businesses every day or launching wars. What we do every day is get up and go to work, right? And that's where overconfidence and and a, a good feeling about your abilities, even if it's not entirely realistic, uh, is is beneficial. Okay. Yeah. That that makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, the the final area I'd like to to tackle uh, in your book relates to uh, love and dating, which uh, to the average person that's that's one of the perfect examples of how irrationality can actually help someone. Uh, I uh, per- personally I'm on the side of the uh, I tend to be a, a realist when it comes to. Uh, my level of attract uh, attractiveness, um, which has not served me, because I have <laughs> I have friends, of course, that uh, will uh, that are are oozing with confidence and are on a scale of one to ten. You know, these are the uh, these are the four to sixes that are approaching the eight to tens, and it always baffled me uh, their level of 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 confidence and in. And even though I would have these conversations about the downsides, it's like, well, that would be embarrassing for me to go up to someone like that. And I wouldn't do that. It, it's clear that the consequences are internal. They're, they're built by myself, whereas the individual that's overconfident, they're increasing their likelihood of having a successful uh, mating experience or, or, or meeting a partner. Um, could you talk a little bit about, about, about irrationality in attractiveness and dating? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so th- this is an area of some research. And by the way, this this chapter is one that people uh, have really responded to. I think that that they've been one way or the other. There, people can relate to this t- chapter on love. It's called Soulmates. Is the name of the chapter. Um, the the you know first of all, confidence in in the dating scene uh, has benefits. One is one is that you know people who are seen as confident are seen as more attractive in many circumstances. And uh, uh, that I think you can take it too far and be very annoying, right? But, but, but if you have, as you suggest, if you have the confidence at least to make lots of approaches to people, right, then you're likely just simply in terms of numbers and, and your likelihood of success is higher. Um, uh, the, and it, there's also some evidence that, you know, and part of your story sort of suggests this is that, that, that if you're in a competitive dating situation where there are more than one person who might be interested in a, in a target you know, partner, uh, the confident person is likely to clear out the other people that, the, the, you know, that, that the, that the less confident individuals are likely to, to just, you know, stay away and not, not engage because they're afraid, you know, that they realize this person is going to get all the attention. Um, so, so confidence has has some value according to the research in in those situations. Again, I, I, you know, these are short term sort of like speed dating studies that are done, and some of them are paper and pencil. So it's hard to say uh, what that does in the long term, but uh, but but there's clearly something there. I always wonder in this specific area, is this level of overconfidence, is this, is it possible to harness this irrationality and actually change your perceptions of dating? Or is this likely a a trait that is just, that just varies in the population? Yeah. So that's, that is a, a topic that I absolutely do not get into in the book, and and it would I I am not qualified to answer that question. I think that uh, much of, much of what I'm talking about in the book is is things that you either have or you don't. Right? You're either right. this kind of a person or you're not. Clearly, there is nature and nurture involved in becoming one or the other, but I don't try to speculate on all of that, and it's not meant to be a self help book. Uh, in the sense of like, here's what you need to do to be better at dating, um, you know that that sort of thing. But um, but it's it's just I'm just reporting the facts as they as I find them. Uh, and, uh, and but I suspect there is you know I'm sh- sure there are books out there and there are programs that are available to do that. And simply having more experiences and un- undoubtedly helps people deal with that. 
Well, thank you so much uh, for, for being on. Uh, the, again, the name of the book is The Uses of Delusion, Why It's Not Always Rational to Be Rational. Uh, it was It's super interesting. There are very clear, clear benefits that are that sort of occur um, uh, in, in many cases uh, from that from irrational behavior, and this book uh, covers all of them. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being on today, uh, Stuart Vise. Ryan, thanks so much for having me. It was a great conversation. I enjoyed it a lot. on Stuart, visit StuartVise.com. That's S-T-U-A-R-T-V-Y-S-E dot com. You can also follow him on Twitter, at Stuart Vise. Check out his column in Skeptical Inquire magazine entitled Behavior and Belief, or purchase his new book, The Uses of Delusion, Why It's Not Always Rational to Be Rational wherever books are sold. If you'd like to explore more on the topic of rational thinking, download episode 15 of this podcast called Rational Thinking, featuring Dr. Richard Nisbet. Be sure to follow the Why Do We Do That Facebook page for updates and additional content. Don't forget to rate and write a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow on Instagram at Why Do We Do That Podcast or Twitter at WDWDT pod. As always, feel free to email me at why do we do that podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Dr. Ryan Moyer, hoping you found some answers to the question why do we do that? <laughs>